questions? By the way, anybody out there in YouTube land, this is coming to you from the University of New Mexico. You, uh... Okay, um, questions? All right. Let me, um, say that I've, uh, I think that what I was saying last time about uh, renormalizing in a sort of um, humble way, I think this does make sense. And I figured out how to do the uh, uh, charge renormalization in spin of QED, so that's what I'm going to do now. Uh, the thing is, we have to, uh, discuss not the term with p squared, blah, 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 but the term that multiplies it. And, um, and in fact, so what I'm going to do is um, assume that we, well, let me just start with what it is that we're dealing with. Um, So we're talking about this diagram. We can have P here, K. Um, we can call this P minus K and then P. And uh, remember that this is basically minus, uh, minus I E squared integral P plus K or the uh, I to the fourth, and then uh, I'm going to write this as I squared that's over the two fermion propagators, and then we have a trace here of gamma mu k slash minus p slash plus m gamma nu uh, k slash plus m, and then this is divided by uh, P minus K squared minus M squared uh, plus I epsilon times K squared minus M squared plus I epsilon. Because it's a loop diagram, the I epsilons are actually important. Um, when I was talking about this last time, I had a bit of trace phobia um, because uh, when I had done that, I had last semester done the trace with eight gamma matrices, which was um, really a little too much. Um, this one actually is much simpler because you see you can use the relation, the trace of gamma mu, gamma alpha, gamma nu, gamma beta, which is the form we have here, is four g mu alpha g mu beta minus g mu nu g alpha beta plus g mu beta g nu alpha or g alpha nu. Do I have this right? Mu with alpha, okay. Mu with nu, mu with beta, yes. And um, anyway, if you do that, then, um, and you drop the various terms, uh, which the p mu, p nu terms, then um, what you have is something that Schwartz called ip mu nu mu nu 2, and it's minus 4 e squared and integral d fourth k to the the fourth, and then to k mu k nu plus g mu nu uh, minus k squared plus p dot k plus m squared. And then this is over those two denominators. I just write them like this. Then we do the, um, the Feynman trick and um, 
this then becomes uh, pi mu nu 2 is uh, for i e squared integral d fourth k 2 pi to the fourth. Um, and then integral 0 to 1 dx. Uh, and then what you have is 2k mu k nu minus g mu nu. This is after a shift on k. So you let, you shift k mu to k mu um, plus p mu times 1 minus x, that's a 1. And then this becomes uh, g mu nu times k squared minus x, 1 minus x, p squared minus m squared, and then down here we have something simpler, which is um, k squared plus p squared x, 1 minus x minus m squared squared. This is after a um, Uh, after a wick rotation, um, at least I think it's after a wick rotation. Um, anyway, once we have this thing of the form k squared, if we had kept the i epsilon, then we could do the wick rotation. And then uh, this is uh, k squared is just k Euclidean squared. And then what you get if you use the dimensional regularization techniques that we talked a little bit about last time and that are discussed in uh, Appendix B, what you get is pi 2 mu nu is uh, minus e squared over 2 pi squared p squared g mu nu integral 0 to 1 dx x1 minus x 2 over epsilon this is so d is 4 minus epsilon this is 2 over epsilon plus log some mu tilde squared over m squared minus p squared x1 minus x. And there are other terms of order epsilon, and you're supposed to take the limit epsilon going to zero. So I'm um, using that dimensional regularization calculus to get something in a nice form. And so now let me go to these other notes. Okay. Um, Let's set mu tilde squared equal to m squared. And um, once again, my view is here that this thing is, uh, I mean, represents this divergent integral. But what's finite, I'm going to let this be uh, the following, minus e squared p squared g mu nu over 2 pi squared, and I'm going to call this sigma, the rest of this sigma. Then what we can say is that um, sigma is integral 0 to 1 dx, x 1 minus x, 2 over epsilon minus log of, um, yeah, minus log of 1 plus Q squared over M squared, X, 1 minus X. Q squared here is minus P squared. So we're going to be looking at this. This is going to be thought of as a T-channel process. So I'm thinking of this as then sigma of Q squared, which is to say sigma minus P squared. OK, well. D sigma, the q squared, of course, is something quite finite. And in fact, if you do the differentiation, at least the way I did it, I got minus 1 over m squared, and integral 0 to 1 dx, 
x squared 1 minus x squared over 1 plus q squared over m squared x 1 minus x. So the derivative of sigma with respect to q squared is perfectly finite. And what we can do is we can say then that sigma of q squared is equal to some sigma of q0 squared uh, minus uh, this integral, which would be from q0 squared to q squared to q squared of 1 over m squared integral 0 to 1 dx x squared 1 minus x squared over 1 plus q squared over m squared x one minus x. And um, if we let beta equal uh, q squared over m squared x 1 minus x, then this is just an integral, well, then this is sigma of q0 squared minus the integral d beta, 0 to 1 dx, x, 1 minus x, over 1 plus beta. So that's not all that hard. And um, that gives us uh, sigma of q0 squared minus the integral 0 to 1 dx, x, 1 minus, yeah, let, let me just um, mention what happens here. If beta, you see, is q squared over m squared x, 1 minus x, then, now I, I almost feel as though I've left, ah yes, this is the q squared, and then I borrow an x, 1 minus x, and the 1 over m squared, and that's the d beta term. And um, so this is actually then the log of 1 plus beta at the two limit points, and that's 1 plus q squared over m squared x 1 minus x divided by 1 plus q0 squared over m squared x 1 minus x. And um, once again, that's perfectly finite, and uh, uh, mathematics can probably even do that integral. But um, what we can do is, at this point, make more contact with um, with Schwartz's term. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the log of the denominator and combine it with sigma of q0 squared um, and uh, say that uh, then that's something that gets measured and then we find out what sigma of, of q squared is. So I call that, um, I said this then was equal to sigma of q0 squared plus i0 minus integral 0 to 1 dx, x 1 minus x, log 1 plus q squared over m squared, x 1 minus x. All right. Now, and, and i0 is obviously, it's the same integral but with q0 squared. Maybe I should, since I zero is zero x x one minus x log one plus two zero squared one squared x one minus x. It's funny how um, Feynman's fingerprints remain over everything, even when we 
do the renormalization in this other way. His, uh, his binding X is still there. Okay, well, um, to make contact now with Schwartz's notation, let's recall that we had pi mu nu was p e squared q squared, it was a minus p squared, over 2 pi squared g mu nu sigma. And equivalently, that's minus e squared p squared over 2 pi squared g mu nu sigma of minus p squared. Okay, and um, Schwartz's dress propagator is this thing. I'm using the right terminology. In any event, what we've got here is minus i g mu nu over p squared. So this is the finely engaged propagator for the photon. That's this term. And then the next term is minus i over p squared i pi 2 mu nu minus i over p squared. And uh, we, I've been leaving out the p mu p nu terms because between conserved currents they go away. All right. So we can rewrite this as i g mu nu is minus i uh, times 1 minus e squared pi 2 of p squared over p squared times g mu nu. And here, pi 2 mu nu here is minus p squared g mu nu pi 2 e squared. So this pi 2 is defined in this way. Okay, well this then, the pi 2 then is a correction to the uh, to the uh, propagator or to the electric charge. And here it's a correction to the propagator. So that means that the effectively the electric charge is momentum dependent. And since this the way I'm doing it, the pi 2 is um, it's related to sigma of q squared. I'm saying that this is something that's measured and um, effectively, all right, so let, let's, let's now go from uh, momentum space to position. Well, no, it's plain momentum space, but let's ask ourselves what is the um, Fourier transform of the Coulomb potential, or the directed Coulomb potential? Well, then it's going to be e squared, 1 minus e squared pi 2 of p squared over p squared, right, and then this is e squared over p squared, 1 plus e squared over 2 pi squared minus sigma of minus p0 squared minus i0 and then plus an integral 0 to 1 dx x 1 minus x log 1 plus q squared over m squared x 1 minus x. All right, I think I've balanced the parentheses. And um, the idea then is that if um, if we're going to compare with experiment, then we have to have the thing the same as what Schwartz has. And so then I'm going to have, I'm going to set these two guys equal to zero. In other words, when, when one measures, this is finite, when one measures this, 
one finds that it's finite and then it cancels that and then we have this formula which is, which is um, the, the, the Schwartz formula. So in, uh, so in other words, this is equal to e squared over p squared, 1 plus e squared over 2 pi squared, integral 0 to 1 dx, x, 1 minus x log, 1 minus p squared over n squared, x, 1 minus x. Okay, so that's the correction in momentum space to the Coulomb potential. All right, other questions? I see, I see one from. Uh, I just, um, why, why do those terms, why do those terms cancel? Well, it's not that, the, remember, we, 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 we compare with experiment at some point to identify what the um, good catch. <laughs> Uh, to identify what the uh, what these terms are. So the idea that every the idea that I'm taking is that everything's finite. Um, once we do the derivative, everything's finite. Then this is something that we measure. And, or these two are something that we measure. And now if we compare the formula we have with Schwartz's formula, Schwartz's formula is obtained by canceling things in such a way as to agree with the experiment. And um, so in Schwartz's book, <laughs> um, no pun intended. Uh, this is e renormalized, and um, that uh, and and so that's the that's what I'm taking as comparing with experiments since I can't do the experiment. On so these form. corrections have been measured. Huh? These corrections have been measured. Corrections. Well, the I, uh, I mean, yes, in the, I'll, I'll be getting to that in just a moment. Um, in other words, if we take this formula, we'll see it agrees with experiment. Once we've got, once we've uh, dropped these guys. All right. So the spirit of the thing then is that the the Feynman diagrams give you something that you then differentiate, and once you differentiate, everything's finite, and you're basically home free. So that's the viewpoint I'm taking. I think it, I think it makes, I think it makes everything simpler. But as I've said to you, I've never been uh, either a fan or an expert of renormalization, but I, I think this is better, simpler. At least you don't have these damned infinities that you're manipulating out of which makes no mathematical sense in my book. Okay, uh, so let's uh, go to a certain limit. P squared much less than m squared, the mass of the electron. So this is very low energy. Then uh, what happens here? Well, the log of 1 minus epsilon is just minus epsilon. And so then what we have is that this is um, approximately e squared over p squared 1 uh, plus e squared over 2 pi squared integral 0 to 1 dx x 1 minus x times minus p squared over m squared x, 1 minus x. And then um, one simply does the x integral, and, um, and then what you find is that this whole thing is 
e squared over p squared minus e to the fourth over 60 pi squared m squared. So there's the m squared, there's the pi squared, and um, this p squared canceled with that p squared. And, um, oh, uh, right. So this is the expression for very low uh, p squared, and this is called the Ewing term. I really don't quite know how to pronounce it, but anyway, the Ewing term, and um, this actually, if you if you then um, put this change in the Coulomb potential and redo the calculation. Say you redo the non-relativistic hydrogen atom calculator, or you redo, no, the relativistic one with the Dirac equation, but still quantum mechanics, not quantum field theory, then you find out that this extra term, well, first of all, we have to go to, to position space. In position space, this is V of R is minus E squared over 4 pi R, so that's the Coulomb potential, and then minus e to the fourth over 60 pi squared m squared delta of r. So it's a one-dimensional radial delta function. And so when does this contribute? This contributes only, only to s states. Because only s states have um, non-zero wave function at r equals zero. And so this lowers uh, e to s one half. And I guess that, well, when, when Erwin computed this, um, you know, nobody could measure this. Uh, you see, what happens is that in, uh, in the Dirac equation, things depend upon J rather than upon N, well, rather than upon, in the ordinary non-relativistic equation, the energy just depends upon N, apart from the, the fine structure. And in the Dirac equation, it depends upon J. And um, so you have two different J's here. You have 2s uh, 1 half, and then you, you can look at the difference between that and 2p 1 half. The Euling term didn't affect this, but it lowered that. And um, these, um, the difference of the two is. I hope I wrote this down because I wasn't sure whether Schwartz can. Um, and this turns out to be 4.372 10 to the minus 6 dV or 10.54 uh, megahertz. So this is sort of high on the FM band, but very high on the FM band. It's no longer the FM. And um, so in fact, the only term goes in the wrong direction, um, because it lowers this guy. But um, eventually, Lamb measured the thing, and um, and at about the same time, uh, um, Beta did a non-relativistic calculation and got something like a thousand megahertz. Um, and uh, then Feynman, Schwinger, and Tominaga uh, got the right answer, although um, there was some subtlety having to do with gauge invariance and only Tominaga exactly. Anyway, um, 
So that's uh, that's the contribution to the land shift. There are other terms that contribute more than this and that give you uh, this value when you combine them with the Euler term. Um, if, in fact, uh, instead of just expanding for low p squared, you actually do the integral, then what you find is that v of r is minus e squared over 4 pi r 1 plus e squared over 6 pi squared integral from 1 to infinity dx. So this is obviously a different x. e to the minus 2m r x and then 2x squared plus 1 over 2x to the 4 square root of x squared minus 1. So that's um, that's that integral, and if um, for r much bigger than one over m, which is basically equivalent to p squared much less than m squared, um, you then have v of r is equal to minus alpha over r. Here, alpha is e squared over 4 pi, and um, sometimes one puts in an h bar c. Anyway, but in natural units, it's just e squared over 4 pi. So this is 1 plus alpha over 4 square root of pi e to the minus 2mr <coughs> over mr to the 3 halves. So this is, I guess, a more accurate Euler potential. Um, and uh, so the delta function is just an approximation to this thing. And it's, it's, that's, I think, an improvement because it's Having a double function and potential isn't very nice. So it's just an approximation. Okay, um, now let's go to high energy instead of low energy. So let's go to p squared much bigger than m squared. Is there a question? Um, anyway, the fact that uh, Find trigger and Tominaga and Beta were able to calculate something that was what Lamb actually measured. measured. That was when people um, finally believed in quantum field theory made sense. Um, before that, these infinities were so upsetting that people just said, you know, this is this is this is uh, string. Or, well, string theory might be right, some string theory. Anyway, um, and, uh, all right, so let's go to p squared much bigger than uh, m squared. Then what we have is v tilde of p is e squared over p squared 1 plus e squared over 2 pi squared integral 0 to 1 dx x1 minus x log of 1 minus p squared over m squared x1 minus x. Okay. So we now approximate this for high p squared. Well, no problem. Um, it's just that uh, we'll if we're talking about this as a potential, then we better be in p in t channel, and in t channel minus t squared is positive, so minus p squared is huge. We ignore the one, and then what we get is that this is equal to e squared over p squared plus e to the fourth over p squared to pi squared log 
of um, minus p squared over m squared. And remember, logs are such that we also have a term log plus log of x1 minus x, but um, that's, that would be added to this. So it would be plus dot, 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 but the dot, dot, dot are negligible compared to minus p squared over m squared. And um, so this is the uh, potential. In other words, it looks like that. Or another way of writing it is e squared over p squared, 1 plus e squared over 12 pi squared. Wait a minute, I think I may have left. Yeah, I, I, I left something out here. It's, um, it's great that we ignore the x1 minus x in the log, but we still have, um, in fact, let's, let's even not have a parenthesis here. It's still integral 0 to 1 dx, x1 minus x. And so you do that integral, and uh, you find that altogether then it's uh, e squared over 12 pi pi squared log minus squared over m squared. Right. So pi squared comes down and this apparently is 1 6. Um, I hope it's 1 6. Let's just see. Integral dx it's, um, gives us uh, x squared over 2, so that's 1 half, minus 1 third, right? Uh, right, x squared over 1 third. And so that's uh, 1 sixth, yes. Physics is safe. Um, okay, so we're in the t-channel here. And so what we've got here is, um, something quite interesting, namely that um, we can say that q squared, p tilde at q squared minus q zero squared, p tilde at q zero squared, this is then e to the fourth over 12 pi squared log q0 squared over q squared. Another way of talking about this is that there's an effective charge, E effective squared of, let us say, q squared is equal to E squared times 1 plus E squared over 12 pi squared log q squared over m squared. Okay. Schwartz puts an R here for renormalized. Because his things are interesting. Yes? So what happened to the minus sign in the box? Oh, um, we're in the T channel where P squared is negative. Oh, okay. Great question. Let me get you your candy. Sorry. charge as e squared at some scale, momentum scale, which is uh, m squared. And um, 
looking at this again, what we see is that the effective, the effective charge grows logarithmically with Q squared. Now, Q squared, of course, is, is a momentum variable, so that means that the effective charge grows as you go to shorter distances. On the other hand, it shrinks as you go to um, longer distances, which is smaller Q squared. And the reason, the, the picture physically is that at longer, if you have a charge here, what you have are you create E plus, E minus pairs, and they screen the charge so that out here, the measured charge is less. And um, looked at it this way, we see the effect is, is, is a small effect because it's E squared, an extra E squared, and E squared over 4 pi is 1 over 137. And, um, and then logs change very slowly. Okay. So it grows as Q squared uh, goes to infinity. So up as Q squared goes to infinity, down as uh, Q squared goes to zero. And this is R goes to zero, R goes to infinity. So that's the picture. Okay, now at big distances we can we can put in these numbers and figure out what, what's going on. And it's namely the alpha effective at minus p squared is 1 over 137.04. Maybe I should have said 1 over 137. Anyway, 1 plus 0 0.00077 log of minus p squared over m squared. So that's this formula rewritten, the e squared over 12 pi squared gave you the 0 0.00077. And um, this is something that has been seen at, it was, well, I mean, it was confirmed at, at I guess, slack and left, where they were doing e plus e minus scattering at around 100 GeV, and they found that this thing was 1 over um, 128. It went bigger as Q squared goes up. So it was 1 over 128 at about 100 GeV. And, um, okay, now, if we look at this a little bit more, we can say, well, what happens as you go to infinitely high energies? Well, at infinitely high energies, the thing diverges. And the divergence of this coupling constant is, for re some obscure reason, called the Landau pole. And um, Landau, of course, is Lev Landau, a Russian theorist who tragically uh, died in a, uh, well, he didn't die, but he was, he was basically terribly injured in a car accident and um, uh, couldn't do physics anymore. Um, but he was, uh, I guess he was the leading or one of the leading Russian theorists. And of course he and uh, Lifshitz wrote uh, several books on quantum mechanics. Quantum field theory, and they're quite good books. Uh, I know some people who are absolute fans of these books, and they they kind of they look down their noses at um, other books, and uh, just just love Landau's Landau Lipschitz books. Um, Roy Glauber once said to me that um, these books contain not a word of Landau's. Not an idea of Lipschitz by Lipschitz. Of course, that's what some people say. It's not what's really true. Lipschitz is undoubtedly a very good physicist. I heard something, by the way, from Igor, um, who was who, who 
studying at, uh, who has his degree from ITEP, which is where Landau and Lipschitz and the others are. And that um, apparently Landau was apparently worse than Oppenheimer for humiliating people. And um, I mean, he did not suffer fools gladly, is the, is the um, charitable way of putting it. Anyway, um, so this, where is this pole? Well, the pole uh, basically starts when this correction gets as big as unity. And that turns out to be Q equal to 10 to the 286 EV. So you see this is, um, <laughs> this is a um, huge, uh, Energy. I remember I was once I once had the great uh, fortune to talk with uh, Feynman at Caltech. Um, I asked him one question after another. He finally said, "Give me a break." Um, but uh, one of the things he mentioned was that these coupling constants change logarithmically, and so you see what that means. It's uh, an absurd energy to get there. Okay. Well, now let's turn to something called the running coupling. Try to use this chalk. This is a very slow chalk. Um, this chalk is great for a bad blackboard, but it's not so good on a good blackboard. All right, I the GU new. Well. Of course, this is the thing. Ah, yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to go beyond one loop. Okay. So that's our picture where this is P and P and so forth. All right, well, we can, if you are careful about what this means, what you find out is that the potential the t-channel potential is minus e squared over q squared 1 plus e squared over 12 pi squared log q squared over m squared. And here what we're doing is um, we're using this formula. Okay, this is the correction term. And so we're talking pi q squared. So this is for q squared to minus p squared, huge compared to m squared, so that this approximation is valid. And the next one is e squared over 12 pi squared log q squared over m squared. And, oh, sorry, this is squared. So this actually is a very nice geometric series. And you can sum it, of course. And what you get is minus e squared over q squared. Like, let me write it a different way. Minus 1 over q squared. e squared over 1 minus e squared over 12 pi squared log q squared over n squared. Okay. So that's, um, that's what happens when you sum this series. And um, so effectively then, there's a new effective charge. This effective charge of high energies has this uh, form. And this is what people call the running coupling. So e squared effective at q squared then is e squared over 1 minus e squared over 12 pi squared log q squared over m squared. So this is called the running coupling. Now, what, what, what does this mean? 
This means that if you're doing, say, T-channel scattering, then the lowest order diagram is this, the next diagram is this, of course there are others, but... So you sum them all up, you have an effective coupling, and what the effective coupling is, well, it depends upon Q squared. And so you can, uh, in as much as it's of this form, you can say, well, this potential at Q squared is nothing more than minus E squared effective at Q squared divided by Q squared. So in other words, you can say that the potential is effectively just a Coulomb potential, but you have to change the charge. You have to use a charge appropriate to the energy that you're talking about. Now, let's just focus on one more thing, why this makes sense at all. It makes sense because the rate at which the effective charge varies with Q squared is slow. So in other words, if you're somewhere near 100 GeV, then you use this value, and it's good, you know, within 10 GeV or so of 100 GeV. And you use the value, one. so in other words, you can think of it as a constant. That's why it's not completely nuts to say it's the running coupling constant So, it's not constant, but it only varies logarithmically. So it's, it's sort of the running coupling kind of constant. So maybe I should kind of, the running coupling kind of constant. You use one of Ruzba's favorite expressions. Yes. Uh, All right, hold it. Let me get you the can. I don't need the uh, Thank you. You might need the uh, mother. <laughs> the geometric series there. No, wait a minute. Here. Okay, thank you. Oh. Almost. Uh, the series there won't count, won't converge if Q becomes. I'm sorry, so say that again now. The series there, it will, it will not converge if the Q is too big, right? Well, I mean, whether the, the, whether the thing converges depends upon whether e squared log q squared over m squared is bigger or less than 1. But e squared is 1 over 137. All right? It's not very small. And, come on, give me a break. This, this term isn't 1 until you're at 10 to the 286 EV. Right? I mean, so don't worry about it. Okay, now we can do a little more here. We can rewrite this expression as 1 over E squared effective at Q squared is 1 over E squared and what is our effective E squared here? E squared is E effective at Q squared equal to M squared. So 1 over E squared at M squared minus 1 over 12 pi squared log Q squared over M squared. But we could have defined this thing at a different value of a different mass. Then we would have the formula 1 over e squared effective at q squared would be 1 over e squared at mu squared minus 1 over 12 pi squared log q squared over mu squared. So that would be the expression. Okay? And then 
this E squared would be the one that is the charge at energy scale mu squared. So you have to measure that, you have to measure this, and then you know what you're doing. Okay. Well, let's look at this equation. The left-hand side is, doesn't have a mu in it. So it's easy to differentiate with respect to mu. The derivative is zero. So what we get is the equation zero is e d mu of 1 over e squared of mu minus 1 over 12 pi squared log of q squared over mu squared. So this derivative has to be zero. Okay? I see people looking in various directions, thinking deeply. Is there a question? I was kind of wondering why you are able to replace the m by a mu squared here. If you want to, if you want to redefine your e at some new scale u instead of m, that m is still an m right there. But you can do that. No, no, no. The, I think the idea is that we go through the whole yeah. rigmarole again, and you just decide that instead of m squared, it's going to be mu squared. Yeah. It won't affect the derivatives, though. Yeah. Either way. Well, no, we need the mu squared because when we differentiate, yeah, no. there'll be a derivative at some point. At some point. Yeah. Um, all right, let me get you your candy first. Okay, here it comes. Good catch. All right, so let's see. Do we need to look at this more carefully? No, I think, you see, the n squared here was completely arbitrary. Right? Well, yes and no. Let's let's think about it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it may be effective in squared. All right, all right. Here's the point. You see, this e squared here, I was taking as the coupling constant of the theory, and um, so what is what, what do we say? this is? Well, it's at this point, we've got a, this M, this M starts out as the mass of the electron. But, um, we could have the same E effect of a Q squared you see, this e squared then is the e squared effective when q squared is m squared, because this thing vanishes. All right. But we could say that this e squared was the e effective at some other scale, in which case we have the same formula but with a mu squared, but then this e squared would be e renormalized with mu squared. All right. Um, so then when we write things this way, right, now we have an equation that makes sense. This is E renormalized at mu squared, looks like this. Okay. So now we take the derivative. And this is minus 2 E to the minus 3 at mu d by d mu of e of mu and um, the rest of this is minus 1 over 12 pi squared of u squared over q squared minus 2 q squared over mu cubed. And um, when we rewrite that, what we get is mu d e d 
well, I could put in extra steps, but cutting to the chase, mu de d mu is e cubed over 12 pi squared. And this is called beta of uh, e. Beta of e then is just e cubed over 12 pi squared. So this is called the renormalization group equation. And this thing, as far as I know, is not a group, or at least I don't. I guess you can think of it as a group of transformations. Um, so here, it's the coupling constant renormalized at mu. And um, And that's the same thing as E effective at Q squared equal to mu squared, because if you set Q squared equal to mu squared, you see E effective at Q squared is the same as E squared at mu squared. So we could equally well call this E of mu is effectively E effective of mu. All right, well that, I think, is, is enough for that chapter. Um, in the next chapter, what we're going to do is um, talk about the magnetic moment of the uh, electron. And so there's a renormalization uh, effect there, or there's a loop effect, let us say. and. Um, I guess I can introduce this by following uh, Schwartz here, but I remember when I last did this bit of, um, of Schwartz's uh, book um, in an earlier chapter, there was something wrong and I had to correct it. And um, so I, ha I haven't had it enough time this afternoon. See, I got a haircut. Um, I haven't had enough time to remember to look in my notes, my old notes, to see what it was that was wrong about the original treatment. But maybe what he's got here is correct. Anyway, it's basically right. So we have the Hamiltonian is p squared over 2m, the non relativistic Hamiltonian for the electron, e over 2m, e dot. L plus GS. So this is the way you think of the uh, electron non-relativistically. And you have here S is sigma over 2. And now if instead you use the Dirac equation, what you find is that automatically this G is equal to 2. And um, this is from using the Dirac equation, I d slash one, uh, minus m psi equals zero, but this is a four component object. And um, so this was one of the big successes of the Dirac equation. The other was getting the energies right, but um, this was getting the uh, spin uh, right. And for the, this was said to be the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron. Uh, why was it 2 rather than 1? Uh, in other words, you should just add L plus S as the thought. But no, you have to add L plus 2S. So then people wonder, what is it exactly 2? And um, I guess uh, Dirac figured this out in the 20s, the late 20s. And um, in the, I guess around 1950, maybe 20 years later or so, uh, Schwinger, Feynman, and Tomonaga worked out what the loop correction to G was. Uh, and um, there are various ways of uh, of doing this. One way which um, 
Schwartz likes is to square this thing. And this is a, you know, this is perfectly fine. What you get is minus d slash squared plus m squared psi equals zero. And then d slash squared, well, this is d mu d mu plus e over 2 f mu nu sigma mu nu and sigma mu well, all right. sigma upper mu nu is i over 2 the commutator of gamma mu with gamma nu. Remember, this was the remarkable aspect of the Clifford algebras. Um, uh, namely that I over 2, the commutator of two gammas, uh, is a way of representing the generators of the Lorentz group. And that's quite remarkable that one can um, do that. Uh, okay, uh, there's not much blackboard left, so let me, let me go back there. Um, Got a few minutes left, and so I'll I'll say to within plus or minus sign or a factor of two. Um, this is what one gets, namely d mu d mu plus m squared plus e over two f mu nu sigma mu nu psi equals zero. And now this e over 2, f mu nu, sigma mu nu, is then minus e, b plus i e dot sigma, 0, 0, b minus i e dot sigma. So that's, um, that's what that looks like. And so the full um, Dirac equation here turns out to be, well, maybe I'll use this blackboard up front, which is a race, but it's not a very good blackboard. So maybe I'll use the slow chalk line. So we get H minus E A zero squared sine over two M. And that turns out to be M over two plus P minus E A squared over two M minus 2e over 2m p dot s plus or minus i e over m e dot s psi. And I'm just a little bit puzzled as to why we've got plus or minus. That doesn't make any sense. Well, anyway, as I said, I um, basically um, ran out of time at this point. I didn't have time to even check these equations to, to be sure. Um, so, any any questions about the main uh, business or dimensional representation? So we'll go on with this next time. I guess we might as well stop.